So, I'm excited. <laughs> uh, for those of you who weren't here last week, we did a lot, we did what, what I call my version of Act One of Hamilton, and, uh, and it is being literally shot out of a revolutionary cannon, it felt like, with all that excitement, and this amazing team first look at the life, the work, and the spiritual lessons of our founding fathers, and specifically at Alexander Hamilton. Besides being the guy on the $10 bill, our treasury, <laughs> treasury secretary, Hamilton was one of the more unlikely founding fathers. George Washington's chief of staff during the Revolutionary War, and a courageous general at the Battle of Yorktown. He also started the Department of the Treasury and the very institutions of Wall Street. But more than all of that that he gave us, he came from a very humble background. He was a poor, orphaned immigrant from the Caribbean, and with the sheer force of his will, his intellect, and the power of his words, he changed our country forever. Alexander, as we will see in this week's talk, has many lessons for all of us. He embodies the American ideal of the hard-working immigrant and the spiritual principles that anything, anything is possible if you set your mind to it. You take action part and you believe it in your heart. He also shows us that energy and passion and commitment can be destructive when we turn it inward on ourselves or onto others without self-awareness and compassion. Above all, Alexander Hamilton's rise to prominence astonished everyone who ever saw him. How does a bastard orphan son of a whore and a Scotsman drop? In the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by Providence, impoverished and squalor, grow up to be a hero and a scholar. The ten dollar founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder by being a lot smarter by being a self starter by 14. They placed him in charge of a trading charter. And every day while slaves were being slaughtered and carted away across the waves, he struggled and kept his daughter inside. He was longing for something to be a part of. The brother was ready to beg, still borrow more barter. Then a hurricane came and devastation reigned. Our man saw his future drip, dripping down the train. Put a pencil to his temple, connected it to his brain, and he wrote his first refrain. My name is Alexander Hamilton And there's a million things I haven't done But just you wait, just you wait He was ten, his father stood full of it, dead Then two years later see Alexander's mother bed And half dead, sitting in their own sick, the same thing And Alex got better, but his mother went quick Moving with the cousin, the cousin committed suicide
island of Nevis and the Caribbean, an illegitimate child, as you just heard, which carried quite a stigma at the time. And to top that off, when Alexander was 11, his father, James, was deeply in debt and then abandoned Alexander, his brother, and his mother on the island of St. Croix. Soon after, his mother, Rachel, contracted a fever and died while she was holding the sick 12-year-old Alexander in his arms, in her arms. At the age of 12, he had to go to work. <laughs> he had to go to work and used his brains, his words, and then tenacity to get himself to colonial New York and quickly involved himself in revolutionary pro uh, politics. In New York, he meets people that will shape his future. To this amazing group of friends, Hamilton demonstrated himself as capable, brave, intelligent. And then, then he meets George Washington, and he proves himself indispensable to him as well. His intelligence and drive lead him to the role as George Washington's aide-de-camp during the Revolutionary War, and then to a highly successful role as a courageous and successful general at the Battle of Yorktown. The words, the energy, the faith, and the daring of these young men and women made the impossible possible, because they believed it possible. The British Empire, the undisputed world power at the time, was defeated at Yorktown by these ragtag, underfunded, <laughs> unorthodox colonial armies. Hamilton and his friends, a collection of immigrants, farmers, students, and people of color, were crucial, crucial to the American Revolution. And they literally turned the world upside down. Aaron Burr, who he met in New York, and Alexander Hamilton were both orphaned at an early age. Not quite yet. <laughs> Sorry, we'll jump ahead. Alexander Hamilton uh, and Aaron Burr were orphaned at an early age, both intellectual uh, prodigies in their own right, and both revolutionary soldiers. They continued their long string of parallels. After the war, Hamilton and Burr returned to New York and qualified to be lawyers almost at the exact same time. And then they moved to opposite ends of Wall Street and started up their practice. They were two rising stars of the New York scene. But the parallels in their lives continue, and they both become parents at the same time.
For those of us and for those of us who are uncles, parents, mothers, fathers, that idea embodied in that song is so appropriate. Regardless of becoming a parent, Alexander Hamilton was still nonstop. It <laughs> wouldn't slow down. In fact, it gave him greater impetus. In 1887, it was Alexander Hamilton who actually called for a constitutional convention. And then at the convention, he gets up and he gives this six-hour speech about this new form of government. Right? Six hours. Six. I promise not to make this show that long. <laughs> Six hours about a new form of government in which the president would rule for his lifetime on good behavior. So just after winning the Revolutionary War, you can imagine that this didn't go over so well with everyone else. And so Hamilton's biggest contribution would come after the convention, through the writings which would later become known as the Federalist Papers. It was like a commercial for the Constitution. There were 85 essays written in total in just six months. John Jay wrote five of them. James Madison wrote 29 of them. And Hamilton wrote to the other 51. <laughs> 51 in six months. Right? He writes while traveling. He writes everywhere he goes. He really does write like he's running out of time. Hamilton doesn't hesitate. He knows no restraint. And he constantly, constantly raises the stakes. You know how exhausting people like that are? That's why I'm going on sabbatical. <laughs> My music team's going, yeah, yeah. Aaron Burr is the opposite. He's willing to wait for it. He can wait, and he can wait. He checks out how the wind is blowing before he'll jump in. He sees everyone else pass him by, get advanced, be successful, and yet he still can't get into the game. For that reason, he hesitates. He hesitates because of the losses he's experienced in his life. But to this day, in America, we follow the model of George Washington, the two-term presidency and a peaceful transfer of power. That made America a democracy different than any democracy that preceded it. And Washington established a cabinet. The cabinet, as we know it today, was not set up in the Constitution. Washington appointed Hamilton as Treasury Secretary. Edmund Randolph is the first Attorney General. Henry Knox was the Secretary of War, and Thomas Jefferson was the Secretary of State, all under Washington's protection. And Hamilton assumed great power. Hamilton was the first Treasury Secretary and sort of the de facto Vice President, well, Assistant President, because the Vice President as we know it then and today doesn't have a real job. <laughs> so as Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton, Hamilton created much of the federal government. He created the first budget systems, the first tax systems, the first Coast Guard, monetary policy, and central bank. Hamilton's had this core idea of an aggressive role for the federal government to help the economy. He built financial institutions. At the time, there were five treasuries sold on Wall Street. Right? Three of them are treasury securities for the United States created by Alexander Hamilton. The fourth is the stock of the Bank of New York also created by Alexander Hamilton. And the fifth is the stock of the first central bank, created by Alexander <laughs> Hamilton. <laughs> Hamilton was also rigidly ethical when it came to his work. He did not participate in any of the markets that he created. He and his family lived on his federal salary while his work made fortunes for other people. And because he came from a humble background, Hamilton had this almost naive belief that money would make people do ethical things. Um, <laughs> Hamilton meets Jefferson when Jefferson returns home from Paris after the war. As we discussed last week, these men are walking contradictions. Right? They're not pure. They're not perfect. They're flawed like all of us in human. Jefferson, who wrote the immortal words, all men are created equal, owned people until the day he died. And we don't have to make that all right, and we don't have to make peace with it. What we have to do is take all of them off the pedestal. What we get to do is take all of them off the pedestal and see them like us. 
who dare greatly and sometimes fail greatly. Hamilton was busy creating a vision of a robust, strong government, and that was the engine of the finance of the democracy and industry that became America. He diversifies our economy and unites our states around a central future. Jefferson, though, had another vision in mind. He pictured this agrarian paradise where farmers were left alone to do their thing. In this strange juxtaposition, Jefferson, who comes from wealth and privilege, and who lived out the war in Paris, represents the, Ham uh, the everyman, right? the every farmer, worker. While Hamilton, who grew up poor, a bastard immigrant from the islands, represented Wall Street moneyed interests. <laughs> If we only had a parallel today of a wealthy man from a large international city laying claim to a populist message, or a <laughs> it eludes me. <laughs> the states had borrowed heavily at that point to finance the war. There were $25 million, think about this, in the late 1700s, $25 million in state debt and $50 million in federal debt from the war. Hamilton wanted the federal government to assume the state debt, to stimulate the economy and to free up capital for industry. Uh, Jefferson wanted a very weak federal government and wanted the states and the farmers to be left alone. Jefferson's position was that the, summer, the southern states were not in debt, and so therefore it made no sense for them to bail out the states that incurred debt. Hamilton's argument was that the southern states didn't have debt because they didn't pay for labor. And who did they think they were kidding? <laughs> these arguments got so heated and no love was lost between these two men. In fact, not only Jefferson, but Madison as well. Once a great friend of Hamilton who helped him write the Federalist Papers, they became very bitter and estranged. Which was also, because uh, Madison was also a rich southern landowner owner and slave owner. And these arguments over states' rights, they drew a wedge between them that we still see in our politics today. Yeah. Hamilton gets the major players, the two Southerners, Jefferson and Madison, and himself, the immigrant, into a room over dinner and strikes a compromise that gets him what he wants. Alan Burr continued to watch from the sidelines. He watched Hamilton's power grow, and he had been shut out of power, shut out of influence, and shut out of the room where it happens. and an immigrant walk into a room diametrically opposed foes they emerge with a compromise having open doors that were previously closed Bros. the immigrant emerges with unprecedented financial power a system he can shape however he wants the virginians emerge with the nation's capital and here's the piece de resistance no one else was in the room where it happened the room where it happened the room where it happened Like to work a little closer to home. 
Actually, I would. Well, I propose a Potomac. And you'll provide him with votes? Well, we'll see how it goes. No! Well, what else was in the room where it happened? The room where it happened? The room where it happened? No one else was in the room. Did you know, even then, it doesn't matter where you put the U.S. Capitol? Cause we all have the banks. We're in the same spot. You got more than you gave. And I wanted what I got. When you got skin in the game, you stay in the game. But you don't get a win unless you play in the game. Oh, you get love for it. You get hate for it. You get nothing if you wait for it. Wait for it. Wait! God help and forgive me. I want to build something that's gonna outlive me. What do you want? What do you want? I want to be in the room where it happens, the room where it happens. I want to be in the room where it happens, the room where it happens. to grow. However, sometimes we know that great success comes stupid mistakes. And all of us have made some great achievements and then sabotaged ourselves or found we were right against the limit of what we could do and get scared and retreat. Hamilton's big flaw was his inability to shut up. His tenacity and drive are great things when we're at war. They're phenomenal, but in the absence of a common enemy, that virtue can sometimes be turned inward. And from assets, they're turned to flaws. Hamilton, probably because of his mother, had this blind spot for women, especially ones in dire situations and in need of help. Even in the middle of the Revolutionary War, he and Washington show up at West Point and discover the plot by Benedict Arnold to turn over West Point to the British. Benedict Arnold runs away in the middle of the night, sneaks out, and leaves his wife there alone. And when Hamilton and Washington discover the wife, she is beside herself, just erratic and irrational. She's really seeming to have lost her mind, and Hamilton takes great affection for her and lets her go on to move on to France. The irony was that Mrs. Arnold was just as much involved in the traitor, just as much a traitor as Benedict was. But Hamilton couldn't see it. Now this may explain the Reynolds scandal. A young woman, Mariah Reynolds, shows up at Hamilton's door while he was away. She gives him a sob story about her husband abandoning her. 
she asked him for money and help, and he feels bad for her. But he ends up giving her money and a lot more. <laughs> they end up in this <laughs> torrid affair. Her husband finds out, or more likely, he springs the trap that he had set. He reappears and demands a thousand dollars from Hamilton, where he will immediately write Eliza. Hamilton forks over the money and continues the affair for another year. The story leaks, but with fuzzy details. Hamilton gets accused of speculating in the Treasury Secretaries with James Reynolds, so he decides that he's going to write a pamphlet about the affair. And remember, Hamilton wrote his way out of the islands. He wrote his way into Eliza's heart. He wrote his way into Washington's good graces. He wrote papers which convinced the entire nation to ratify the Constitution. So he writes publicly about this affair and argues that as a public figure, he is totally upstanding. He has done nothing wrong. But as a private figure, he just had an affair and played but paid blackmail for it. I'm so glad that our current political leaders have learned this lesson. <laughs> Hamilton's letter reads like a cross between a dissertation and a dear penthouse letter. It's not that he's bragging, but he's oblivious, oblivious to the situation that he's fermenting. Eliza is so traumatized by the publication of this pamphlet that she never publicly comments about what happened. She didn't have many options. They had eight children together, and she was tied to him and to his fortunes. But what she does do is burn all of his correspondence. Thank you. 
Portrayals. The Hamiltons enter a period of distance and a painful truce when their lives are devastated even further. Their eldest son, Philip, a recent graduate of King's College in the light of their eyes, challenges a man named George Eaker to a duel. Challenges him a duel because Eaker had said something publicly against Alexander Hamilton. The rituals of dueling may seem insane to us today, but it is important to understand that men didn't go to duels at this time to kill each other, but to prove that they were courageous enough to be there and that they were men of merit. Most duels ended without a shot being fired. Hamilton himself had negotiated his way out of at least 10 duels. Because <laughs> he said a lot of shit. <laughs> Yeah, as we said last week, restraint of pen and tongue was not his strong suit. <laughs> so he counsels his son to show up in the duel, to raise his gun up into the sky, and to shoot into the air. That would satisfy Mr. Eaker, and they could both save face. So they row across to Hudson, who we we talk in, because everything is legal in New Jersey. <laughs> Great. And they commence the duel. Before the count reached seven, though, George Eaker shoots. And the gun, the bullet, hits Philip Hamilton. It lodges into his hip, and he's taken to the doctor. Alexander and Eliza both rush to his side, but by the time they get there, the infection has set in. And with his parents by his side, he breathes his last breath. Alexander, by all accounts, is unhinged, unhinged by the loss of his son. And if you see portraits of him during this time, you can see that he has aged drastically.
Says it to you like you look tough It's quiet uptown He is trying to do the unimaginable Walking through the park Long after dark Taking in the sights of the city Look around, look around To my eyes up He is trying to do the unimaginable There are moments that the words don't reach There's grace too powerful to name we push away what we can never understand We push away the unimaginable They are standing in the garden Alexander Biden lies outside She takes his hand It's quiet uptown Forgiveness Can you imagine When in Hamilton out of the picture, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr run for president to replace John Adams. Burr was backed by two different parties in that election. And people were commenting that he was handy to have in politics because he changed his position so often. <laughs> Hamilton writes a letter saying that this cannot be a good thing. He has no principles. So the election ends up in the Electoral College, it ends up tied, and so it's thrown into the House of Representatives. People ask Alexander Hamilton who he supports, and facing a choice between the two men he hates, he chooses Jefferson. Because even though he says he doesn't agree with a single thing Jefferson says, at least he has principles. And Jefferson becomes president, and at the time, the person who comes in second became vice president. So Aaron Burr is Jefferson's vice president. When Jefferson runs for re-election, Burr goes back to New York. And again, he finds himself thwarted by Alexander Hamilton. Burr loses for governor and flies into a rage and thinks that every turn, at every turn, the person who has been blocking my path forward is Alexander Hamilton. Burr then reads in an Albany newspaper that Alexander Hamilton had said something writing about him at a dinner party. And Burr writes him this long letter, demanding a public apology or to face him in a duel. Hamilton could have ended the whole affair by apologizing for unintended consequence or offense. But he says instead, smart ass that he is, you're going to have to be a lot more specific in your letter. I say a lot of shit about you. <laughs> years worth of disagreements. <laughs> they write long letters back and forth to each other all this time to cool off and to stop this, but they don't. They keep going forward. And the, the ultimate irony is at the end of all these pages and pages of correspondence, they sign it, your obedient servant, a a dapper, or a dot ham. <laughs> Very formal and ready. It's like, so one morning, the two of them row across the Hudson to Lee Hawken. And in the exact same spot that <coughs> his son Philip is killed, Alexander Hamilton raises his gun back to the air and shoots into the sky as Burr's bullet strikes him right between the ribs. Hamilton is rowed back across the Hudson and birds whisked away. It says, history says, legends say, that birds
Burr was told to hide, and that Eliza and Angelica were at Hamilton's side when he died. And you could hear wailing throughout the city. In the show, Aaron Burr, at this moment, sings, when I raised, when Alexander raised his gun to the sky, he was the first to die. But I'm the one who paid for it. I survived, but I paid for it. Now I'm the villain in your history. I was too young and blind to see that the world was wide enough. The world was wide enough for Alexander and me. Let me tell you what I wish I'd known when I was young and dreamed of glory. You have no control. Who lives, who dies, who tells your story? President Jefferson. I'll give him this. His financial system will work as a work of genius. I couldn't undo it if I tried. And I tried.
when JD and I saw this show in New York, we sat between, or excuse me, on each side of our adopted orphan son. And when this act happened, I could not contain my tears. But on the subway ride home after, he looks at me and he said, I don't like Alexander Hamilton. Oh. And I said, tell me about that. And there's a story that has not been told in America about Alexander. And it's only taken us 200 years, so it's about time. But also about Eliza. And what Eliza did to make a world a better place by telling the story, by stepping out and choosing which stories to tell about, not speaking about the hurt and the betrayal, but speaking about what was important, and to establish the orphanage and to raise hundreds of children. That <coughs> orphanage that she established, the first orphanage in New York City, still exists. Still exists to this day. This is a picture of it from the turn of the century when it was, you know, only a hundred years old. <laughs> and it was on their website last night, looking at what they do. Hundreds and thousands of children's lives have been changed by what Eliza did for Hamilton. And the line that she sings there, that every time I look into their eyes, I see yours, mm. makes me know that it is most important what we teach, that we are all divine expressions. Amen. That we can look into each other's eyes and see the good. We can have all the drive and we can have all the words and we can make things happen in the world and that's all important. But to roll over people and to create chaos in your wake is not the answer either. There's a balance between these two acts. In time of war, as Misa first named this first act, and in time of peace. And somewhere there's the balance. Those moments of actual being in the world and making things happen are vastly important. And the time for rest and compassion and self-evaluation and doing the shadow work necessary to know that you're not just projecting it onto these enemies outside yourself. Burr and Hamilton were so much alike. They were so synchronistic. And yet they couldn't get past the smallest of things. What legacy do you want to leave? Seriously. Think about that. What do you want to leave? Eliza, after Hamilton's death, lived another 50 years. She died at 97 years old. 97 years old. And we don't get to know who lives, who dies, or who's going to tell our story. But right here and right now, you can choose what kind of person you want to be, what you want to do with your life, and you can choose whose stories you'll tell today. So, I have been wrestling with how to tell this story for over a year because it's not an easy story to tell. But it's important. Whose story are you telling? What narrative are you putting on your social media? What narrative are you putting out in the actual words of your mouth? From the mouth and from your heart. That is the unity message. And that is the message of Hamilton. You don't get to decide who lives, who dies. But you get to decide what story you want to tell today. I am honored to be another storyteller in this amazing story. And to be part of a legacy like this, while I and J.D. are biologically not capable of reproducing. <laughs> I do know that my mission, my ministry, is children just as much as it is being a spiritual leader here. And that what we do with our children and how we raise them and all the children in the world, from the teddy bears we collect, to the foster children that we take in, to the children we adopt, all we need to do is move the dial one inch and the trajectory 
of those children's lives are vastly different. That's why we have a children's program. That's why I do what I do. And I encourage each and every one of you to step forward and don't waste a second. Namaste.